The Merry Anomaly by Annie Nowicki. This is a passage read by the author. To purchase The Merry Anomaly, follow the link below. You can purchase it on Amazon for only $2.95. The Merry Anomaly. A bystander, had there been one, would have seen little noteworthy about the scene. What is so unusual about a small group of teenage girls getting together, after all? The house, luminous and massive, the sort of structure decried as a McMansion by a certain snobby segment of the population, was full of lively conversation. In all, eight girls were present, reclining in various postures on the living room furniture. All of them were pretty, all wore what would be regarded as casual, preppy clothes, in the broadest sense of that term. Most were sporting form-fitting designer jeans with ready-made holes and patches, as was the fashion at the time, as well as oversized sweatshirts. Indeed, the incipient grunge scene had by this time seeped well into suburbia. One of the group, however, could be set apart from the rest in a few significant details that a conscientious bystander, or one present, would be sure to notice. The first and most obvious thing that caused her to stand out was the fact that, unlike the five other girls, she wore a dress. This, in itself, functioned as a kind of statement, indeed, a rank signifier. The second outstanding quality she possessed was nearly invisible but still easy to discern, or one observant. That is, she exuded a certain unmistakable aura of authority. In spite of the fact that she was merely a peer among peers, the other girls quite unconsciously deferred to her, as they might to a teacher whom they particularly admired. The third aspect of this girl which set her apart was her beauty. It has already been recorded that everyone in this group was pretty, but this girl easily bested the rest. Her lustrous dark hair framed her majestically intense black eyes in a manner that had an especially striking effect on others. Zoe had been compared, variously, to contemporary actresses like Penelope Cruz, Sandra Bullock, Jennifer Connelly, and Phoebe Cates in her younger days. But if one were honest, one would have to admit that she outshone all of the above. Yet, if Zoe was beautiful, something about her countenance was also undeniably terrifying. She seldom smiled, but this was actually a mercy, because her smiles, on the rare occasions when they appeared, seemed always to communicate an intimate intimation of doom and dread. She had been called that hot but spooky chick numerous times by boys at her school. But if Zoe had been aware of having been given this singular moniker, she gave no indication of it. In fact, she retained a self-possessed demeanor that struck others, including adults, as preternaturally uncanny. On this occasion, Zoe's very presence had a certain sobering effect on the other girls, sharing her company in the living room of this McMansion, which belonged to a girl in the group named Natalie. They had chosen to assemble there because Natalie's parents were out of town for the weekend, Given this set of circumstances, one might be led to the sort of conclusion that these girls intended to throw the standard teenage party, complete with boys and alcohol and loud music and probable instances of intoxicated fornication. But in fact, no such evening was in the off offing. After an interval of small talk and requisite gossip had transpired, and a brief lull in the conversation had caused a temporary silence among the group, Zoe expertly seized upon this opportunity to begin the relevant discussion of the evening. First of all, fellow faithful disciples, let us take a moment to commemorate the recent completion of the journey of our sister in sacrifice, Chelsea Victoria Clinton. The girls went silent again, but this time the interval of silence was more filled with a sense of awe and reverence. Some tears were even quietly shed. What an incredible girl, pronounced a big-haired, hoop-earringed blonde, wearing a United Colors of Benetton sweatshirt. She took it all the way, 
muttered a pixie-faced brunette in, the st in stylish denim shorts. Being the first daughter didn't mean a thing to her. May we all be so courageous when our time comes, Zoe declared. She pronounced these words with great solemnity, while also managing to communicate that she was putting a cap on, this, on the discussion of this matter, as it was merely the first item on their agenda that evening. Natalie, the girl whose house they occupied, said nothing. Though she did not cry, she did feel the sorrowful lump in the throat, yet for her the sensation did not merely reflect her inner grief at the announced event of the first daughter's passing, but also a kind of anticipatory excitement, both humbling and profound, at the notion of soon joining the ranks of the sacrificed.